Welcome to Bookaholics, the Paris Institute for Critical Thinking's podcast series dedicated to books. In this series, we introduce you to some recent and relevant books, our own books, and obviously classic books that we just can't stop talking and teaching about. My name is Christoph van Houten, and it is my great pleasure to have our first episode of Bookaholics dedicated to a classic philosophical book, namely Ludwig Wittgenstein's Tractatus Logico Philosophicus, that was first published 100 years ago. And to celebrate this centenary, I am joined today by nobody else but one of Pict's favorite philosophers, Jonathan Ray. Hello, Jonathan, and welcome. Hello, Christoph. It's wonderful to be with you. It's nice to have you again. Now, as you know, Jonathan, here at Bookaholics, we generally have the author of the book starting with some sort of description of what the intentions of their work, why they, why did they write their book was. Now, what was it all about, in fact? Now, this is naturally no longer possible with Wittgenstein. So besides, besides asking you to give a little introducing summary of what the Tractatus is all about, I would also like to ask you why you think it is important to celebrate this centenary. What is it about this book that is worth remembering and celebrating? Well, simply because I think it's one of the most wonderful books ever. It's a very unusual book. It's wonderfully unusual and unusually wonderful. It has this absolutely terrible Latin title, (laughs) which puts a lot of people off and which wasn't actually it wasn't Wittgenstein's idea, that Latin title. And it has bits of unexplained symbolism, which will put you off again. But I would implore people who haven't read the book or have been put off by these things to try again and read it as if it was a poem, as if it was, say, as if it was T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland, which was um, came out in the same year as uh, as the Tractatus, and which readers of The Wasteland know that there will be bits they don't understand or they don't understand the first time or First, they'll understand them and then they won't. And I think we should approach um, the Tractatus in in the same way. Don't expect to understand it all, but expect to get an overall impression of what it's about. And also, as with The Wasteland, to see that it has an enormous, I think, emotional um, impact. Um, So the paradox is, here's a paradox. People get anxious about the Tractatus. They get Tractatus anxiety. And I think that's (laughs) incredibly wrong because... uh, the essential point of the book is to help people avoid or help people get away from intellectual anxiety. Because the background of the book um, was that, well, 10 years before it came out, Wittgenstein, young man, 21, 22 years old, um, no university degree, very brilliant at mathematics and engineering, interested in aeronautics, building things that fly and so on. He got fascinated in the work of Bertrand Russell and Gottlob Frege. He read their books about the basis of mathematics and the connections between mathematics and logic. They attempted to explain mathematical truths in terms of, uh, if you like, linguistic logic. Um, And uh, Wittgenstein was enormously impressed by what they'd achieved. But at the same time, he thought they had misinterpreted their own results because they thought that they had discovered a transcendent world, which was kind of only accessible to people who were really good at logic and mathematics. This is, R- Russell himself said, it t- spoke of it as the world of being. An unchangeable world, rigid, uh, rigid, exact and delightful to the mathematician and the logician. And this, well, obviously, the implication of that is that there are two kinds of people. There are people who are clever logicians and mathematicians who can understand the world of being. And then there are the rest of us who, you know, just speak ordinary language and are very vague and don't really get any of this stuff that the clever boys get. Um, and we and we then sort of expect to be punished for we realize we're not very good at logic and then we get the we expect the logicians to beat us up and um, and you know correct us we know that we don't think very well but maybe the logicians can Wittgenstein says that's complete rubbish the real implications of what Russell and uh, and and Frege had established uh, was that. There's not really another world, a a world only available to people who are cleverer, cleverer 
than us. The way we think is already completely in order as it is. I mean, studying logic may help us to talk about the way we think, but even if we can't talk about the way we think, the way we think is fine. Um, everything is in order. So it's the book works. It's supposed to be a kind of anxiety relief um, mm -hmm. strategy. Um, and the reason why it's in some ways very challenging to read is that it's a book that's I says it, we're constantly in motion. It leads us through a sequence of steps, seven, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. seven main steps, um, each with lots of sub steps. And we begin with the world's everything that is the case. Die Welt ist alles, was der Fall ist. And then right at the end, about silence, wovon man nicht sprechen kann, darüber muss man schweigen. What we can't speak about, we must be, we must be, about that we must be silent. And when we, uh, and, and that end is where we realise that, yes, there may indeed be things that we ordinary people can't understand and can't talk about. But that's because nobody can understand them and talk about them. Even if you were as brilliant as Russell and Frege, the best you could say is these are mysteries and we need to bow down before, bow down before them and realise there's no way we can explain them. Right. So that's why we should end up being silent and we should stop worrying. But the reason we're silent is not that we're so stupid that we can't find the right thing to say, but that we're wise enough to realise that there is nothing to be said. Hmm. Yeah, thanks for this. Just a, a small question. Um, do you think Wittgenstein would have appreciated the fact that you called his book a poem? He would have loved it. Yes. Okay. Um, Brilliant. Philosophy must man dichten. You have to. Um, okay. Yeah. Yes. Philosophy has to be written like poetry. He he took enormous trouble over his writing. He hmm. he wrote typically. I mean, from the young age to his death. He kept enormous books in which he wrote down propositions, I mean, mm -hmm. sentences, phrases. Then he polished them. He turned them around, uh, trying to, I suppose, an act of purification. Um, and it's a certain kind of poetry. It's the poetry that relishes austerity and plainness mm -hmm. rather than uh, florid uh, mm -hmm. romanticism. But uh, I yes, I think he would have, um, I think he might have uh, thought, that someone who said he was a great poet was trying to flatter him too much. He would okay. nevertheless have been quite pleased by the flattery. Okay, yeah. Um, now, before we dig in a little bit deeper in the pages of the treatise, there is one aspect that has always attracted me personally in the coming about of the publication of this book. And uh, in, in fact, uh, for as much as the tractor Tractatus might be a brilliant book. I have always thought of Russell's attitude towards Wittgenstein and especially his help in the publication of the Tractatus as a unique feature of true scholarship, as an act of true philosopher, a real friend of, of, of wisdom. Because in fact, um, Russell, although he didn't understand everything Wittgenstein had written, nor what he had intended to do with the Tractatus, and Wittgenstein obviously never let an occasion go by to uh, make Russell understand or remember that. So although Russell was perfectly aware that it would make his work up until that point seem a little bit surpassed, like he already just explained, he was the main strength behind the publication of, of this text. If it wasn't for Russell, I think the Tractatus would probably never have seen the light of day. So what would you like to say about this gesture and and also what I would consider as a lack of similar academic gestures that we see in today's academia? I, I think it's certainly true that without Russell, the book might never have been published. But um, I think that the, I don't know, the ins and outs of the relationship between Russell and Wittgenstein are so complicated that just to call it an act of selfless generosity may be a bit wrong. I mean, they mm. first met. That's my romanticism. It's, yes, I think. <laughs> yes, it's your romanticism. <laughs> um, uh, it was in 1911 when they met and uh, Wittgenstein, as I said, he was not trained in philosophy. He was in his early 20s um, and he came to see Russell. Russell was then in his late 30s and utterly exhausted. He was at the end of a rotten marriage. He'd produced this enormous with with Whitehead, this enormous three volume book, um, Principia Mathematica, and mm -hmm. he despaired of writing the fourth and final volume. He never got round to it. And he felt that he was intellectually finished. 
He felt that he had been very clever, but he wasn't so clever anymore. And then this German, as he called him, although he, of course, <laughs> Wittgenstein was Austrian, yes, yes. turned up and nagged him and just wouldn't go away and kept saying, you don't understand, and I don't understand how you can say this. I don't understand how you can. And, uh, it, uh, and Russell got, was very ambivalent about it. He said, I think this guy's mad. I want to exclude him from my I don't want to see him again. And then he started using this extraordinary language, saying, I love this man. I love him more than anyone else. Um, I love him. Well, you might be relieved to say I love him like a son, he said. But anyway, he was he became absolutely obsessed. Um, and within two years, uh, I, he's, Wittgenstein, as I said, he was very, Wittgenstein was a perfectionist as a, mm -hmm. as a writer. And he kept saying to Wittgenstein, you must write something down. Um, mm -hmm. And he said, uh, Russell said very rightly that um, Wittgenstein had found it hard to think, write things down because he didn't want to write anything down that wasn't perfect. And if it wasn't perfect, he wouldn't write anything at all. And he said to Wittgenstein, you sit down and dictate something to me and mm -hmm. I will write it up. And it's extraordinary. I think this is this is truly an event of extraordinary generosity. So he's, allowed, he's enabled Wittgenstein to enroll as an undergraduate student at Cambridge where Russell is teaching. And then he says, OK, you can't write your essays, my dear, mm -hmm. dear student, so I will write your essays for you <laughs> if you if you dictate them to me. And he produced this actually rather wonderful document that has been published since called Notes on Logic, in which he um, he, he set out what he thought was the gist of what um, of what Wittgenstein want, wanted to say. And then Wittgenstein went off to Norway and then he went back to Austria and then the war broke out. And for the next five years, Wittgenstein was essentially a soldier in the mm. in the Austrian army. And so they were completely out of touch. Uh, Russell actually assumed that Wittgenstein had died, either that he would have committed suicide or that he would have died in some act of absurd gallantry as a soldier. Um, so they were completely out of touch, but actually Wittgenstein, as we know, didn't die in the war. Um, <laughs> yeah, but, he, but he did actually write the book huh? that he wanted to write. And by the way, the working title of the book was a, it's a beautiful title. It was Desatz, meaning... Huh? Um, well, it's, it, it could mean the proposition or the sentence, but it also has other meanings in German. It can mean, for example, a movement of a piece of music or a section of a poem. Um, and it was such a, so the book is about propositions or statements, but it's also is itself a statement. It was a perfect, if you like, poetic title for the book. Um, he gets it finished in um, 1918 and tries to get it published by small literary publishers in Vienna and then in Innsbruck. Um, he didn't try academic publishers. He didn't want it to be published by a philosophy publisher. Um, he wanted it published by a general literary publisher. And he fails. He fails. And, fa and they said, well, if you pay us. And he said, well, <laughs> I don't have any money. Actually, he probably did have the money, but he thought it would be an insult. He thought if, he, if people don't want to publish my things, then I'm not going to force them to. Um, <laughs> If people can't get anything out of what I've written, then it'd be better not to. And it was at that time that he decided that his future lay in becoming a school teacher. Mm -hmm. um, and I think people sort of rather over dramatize that. I think he just thought he wanted to lead an honest and useful life. And being a country school teacher would be a good way of doing that. It wasn't some act of madness, as, mm -hmm. as people seem to say. I, I was, you know, it was a an interesting job. You got paid for it. You got to mm. talk to lots of children, which he loved doing. Mm. Anyway, um, he he gets gets back in touch with Russell and they um, and talks about his text. And he's so in such despair about getting it published himself that he says, "Look, I'm going to go and be a school teacher. You can have the text and do with it what you like." That was in 1919, I think. And then a couple of years later, Russell did indeed get it published. That's, I suppose, the um, the centenary we're talking about, December 1921. Yeah, yeah. Mm. He gets it published. This isn't in the form we know it. It's published in a actually rather unsatisfactory popular science magazine called Annalen der Naturphilosophie. Um, a, a cheap 
um, ugly publication and uh, and it, it was prefaced by a, an introduction by Russell, which is mm -hmm. notoriously wrongheaded. <laughs> I mean, it completely, it says, Wittgenstein's main point is that ordinary language is terrible and we need an artificial language to save us from it, which mm. is diametrically the opposite of the mm. obvious message of the book. And when Wittgenstein received a copy of this, he was absolutely devastated. Mm. It was ugly. It was full of misprints. Or he said he said he said it was a pirate edition, which is a bit exaggerated, really. <laughs> and that the editor of this magazine was a charlatan, an ad charlatan, a complete mm. charlatan. Uh, and also there was a personal aspect to it that one of Wittgenstein's closest friendships, closest loves with, with, was with someone called David Pinsent, who had just died. He hadn't seen him since 1913, but they'd gone on holiday together. They'd had, a, and and so he dedicated the book to David Pinsent, mm. and he thought, and he wanted, he imagined that he could send a copy of, you know, if it came out, he could send a copy of the beautiful book to David Pinsent's mother, and it would be, a, and here it was, this ugly article in an ugly, ugly, ugly magazine, and he thought it was a complete uh, disgrace to the mm -hmm. memory of, of of Pinsent, and then. Uh, Russell passed it to a friend of his called C.K. Ogden, who was running a, a publishing business in Cambridge. And Ogden said, without even reading it, he said, this is fine. This is the kind of thing I like. I will translate it. I will I will publish the translation on one page and the German original mm -hmm. on the other so that people can learn German from the experience. <laughs> it, was, it was a bit of a nutcase, too. And then it came out <laughs> under the title, not Wittgenstein's title, Tractatus Logico-Philosophicus in 19... 22. So, in a way, we may be getting a bit of ahead of ourselves saying that the publication of the Tractatus was 100 years ago. Under that title, it didn't appear till 1922. And as I said, the title was not uh, Wittgenstein's first choice. And I think that, uh, so was it an act of great generosity by Russell? It was in a way, but um, I mean, Russell did have, I mean, the thing is that Russell had been absolutely infatuated. I think that's not, a, you know, it was pathologically infatuated with Wittgenstein. And after Wittgenstein went to Austria, then uh, Russell had exactly the same kind of crush on uh, D.H. Lawrence, um, mm -hmm. who was probably less worthy of it, or in my opinion. Less <laughs> worthy of it. So, I mean, I think it's, uh, in a way, what, what it tells us about R Russell was that Russell was actually a bit screwed up. Mm. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that that's a good closure, I think, of, of this question. So let us forget Russell and let us turn to the text a little bit. Now, the Tractatus, as we already discovered, is, is not just any old booklet. It, it truly changed the course of what people were doing in so-called analytical philosophy, but not just in mainstream uh, Anglo-American philosophy. Now, how important is this text? First of all, in the general context of analytical philosophy, but then also in philosophy in general as such. Well, if you're talking about the effects that its publication had, then it did indeed have massive effects, um, but mainly because um, because of the Vienna Circle. As soon as it was published in London, uh, people in Vienna um, Scientific-minded philosophers in in Vienna, um, who later came to be called the Vienna Circles, around um, Schlick, Moritz Schlick, <coughs> got hold of the book because they were in love with Bertrand Russell and it had a preface by Bert Bertrand Russell, and they read it and they were absolutely fascinated. They read it rather as Wittgenstein would have liked, and um, that's to say, sentence by sentence in a group and they thought it was fantastically important and they didn't realize they didn't know who Wittgenstein it seems a bit surprising because Wittgenstein's family was well known in Vienna mm. they didn't know who he was and eventually he did find out that Wittgenstein was indeed a, a, a young man a young Viennese I think he'd imagined he was an old old person uh, <laughs> a young and and indeed that he was um he was teaching school in the Austrian Alps and Schlick mm. even went out um to try and visit him in the village where he was working. Unfortunately, Wittgenstein had by that time stopped working there, but they did get in touch. And uh, Schlick had a good relationship with uh, Wittgenstein. Schlick's followers, not so much, mm. like in particular Carnap. They didn't get on at all well. Anyway, 
out of this connection came the idea that what Wittgenstein had done was to create the possibility of a scientific philosophy, mm. a philosophy according to a scientific method, uh, where you could progressively accumulate truths. But the biggest truth that you would accumulate was that the whole history of philosophy understood as the history of metaphysics and ethics was completely empty and worthless. Mm. Um, and you can see how, in a way, when Wittgenstein talks about these, we must be silent about these things, mm -hmm. you could interpret it in that way. But Wittgenstein's reasons for saying you should be silent about these things was that he thought they're too important mm. yeah, exactly. to talk about. Mm. <laughs> Whereas Schlick and his followers, who came to be known as the logical positivists or the logical empiricists, mm -hmm. took his words and applied them to creating a, if you like, a militantly atheistic, pro-scientific version of philosophy, uh, which became triumphant, especially in America, especially with the exile of various um, Jewish philosophers, German and Austrian, Austrian to America. And Wittgenstein was then came to be known as the founder of logical positivism. Mm. Wittgenstein privately said he couldn't stand the idea of being in the same room as a logical positivist. But still, so in a way, you could talk about the effects of the book. The, the, I mean, it's true of all books that their effects are beyond the control of their authors. But in this case, it's a very striking illustration of it. But on the other hand, I think there were other people who did read the book more in the spirit that uh, Wittgenstein would have liked and also students because he went back to teaching in Cambridge in in the 1930s and this was it wasn't very different from his teaching in Austria because students <laughs> in Cambridge you know they were undergraduate students they were probably 17 years old they'd never done mm. any philosophy before we tend to think he wasn't teaching graduate students he wasn't teaching and he and he was doing rather the same as he did with his students in Austrian schools, namely saying, don't worry, don't, mm. you understand things perfectly well, don't let anybody bump tell you you're stupid, because you're not. Mm. And another thing he said to his students was, um, don't try to be intelligent, <laughs> don't try to be clever, that's the thing that really makes things bad, just try to be honest. Mm. That's, anybody can be clever, but the really important thing, the purpose of studying is to tr is, is is to be honest with yourself that's a mm. much harder thing to do mm. and that's a bigger philosophical lesson as well now obviously something also needs to be said about the composition of the tractate as you already referred to it so the the stylistic structuring of the content of this short text is in in numeric sentences in, in in seven different statements but they are subdivided and this subdivision even goes to ten thousands point five for example <laughs> has five point four seven three two one and this is quite unique in the philosophical world and wittgenstein himself in his later work would not return to this peculiar style style so what can you say about it even a bit more about this style and then why do you think in his later writings he did not return to this well i think the positive reasons that he did it was that he wanted to remind his readers that he was taking them through a process I mean, if you might you might say actually a bit like uh, a psychoanalyst takes their patient through a process uh, step by step by step and there are these seven steps um, and so the numbering was a way of um, reminding you that uh, that every stage is just a stage towards the towards the end if you like that you can't take any one section at face value and say this is what Wittgenstein is saying and he's very so he's he you go through these stages with Wittgenstein and you get to the seventh. And then in the famous, beautiful metaphor, which he uses at the end, allow these propositions. Think of them as the rungs on a ladder, which bring you to a place where you can see how things really are. They've brought you up to this great vantage point and you can see the landscape. And now you can throw away the ladder because you realize you don't need it anymore. So that the, the they are steps. I mean, very like psychoanalysts actually. You you go through various stages in order to reach a state of enlightenment or relative happiness, and then you don't need to go over it anymore. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the I think that's the explanation of the 
of, of of the numbering system and well it's true he didn't do the i think you may be exaggerating the extent to which he gave up on it right. he carried on being enormously careful about sequences in right. orders you know he wrote lots of separate propositions and then he would spend ages trying to work out what would be the best order to put them in to help the reader understand and he did indeed number the propositions he didn't use this decimal numbering system so it's true that he that there is something a bit i mean i suppose you might say a bit over the top right. about the numbering system in the tractatus but i think it achieves a wonderful purpose and i don't think he ever really went back on it okay yeah 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 that, that's 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 true now before we turn as, as in our closing uh, topic to to that famous sentence that you just mentioned that he considered the book as some sort of ladder that you can throw away after you had used it. Um, some might think that there's some sort of paradox here. If he had resolved the, the, these questions, these philosophical questions that you can then can throw away, why in the end did he return to philosophy and why did he uh, keep on writing, even though his writing was always, as you said, somewhat problematic to him because he was so perfectionist. But he came back and he did more. Hadn't, had he realized that he hadn't finished or was the ladder still too short to come at, at the final top? I think that in a way, he, he people exaggerate, I think, greatly exaggerate the difference between Wittgenstein when he wrote the book that unfortunately we call the Tractatus um, and, and what he did later. I mean, he did think I, the you could say the message of the Tractatus is that there is no message. I mean, that's to say philosophy is not going to tell you how to live. It's not going to tell you how to think. But on the other hand, once you've realized that, that will liberate you from the from the anxiety that you may be doing something that's philosophically illegitimate. And I think that he did think that he'd set out that in a way that he was as satisfactory as he could manage. Uh, he'd done that by, you know, in the book he finished in 1918 that was published in 1921. And he thought that in a way he didn't need to do it again. But then, well, it's like, you know, uh, folly keeps keeps growing up you know weeds keep growing in your garden you have to keep mm. um people aren't but a new individuals will grow up with new intellectual anxieties and his uh his task as a teacher and as a writer was to try and tell people you need don't need to get worked up about this um and so i don't think when he said when he it's it's, it's I think people overdo this, quoting him, you know, usually rather mockingly, saying, "How can he possibly have said he thought that he'd solved all the problems of philosophy? How could he have been so arrogant?" But mm. in a way, it's not because he thought he was the cleverest person in the world. He was cleverer than Russell and cleverer than cleverer than Frege and cleverer than Kant and cleverer than Hegel, and that he'd sorted it all out. It was that he thought he'd, he'd come to a certain, he'd achieved a certain peace of mind about what philosophy tries to do namely that philosophy tries to do something very important about understanding the mysteries in life but in the end you have to realize that the best thing you can do with those mysteries is to keep quiet about them and so that's the sense in which he thought he might have brought philosophy to an end not that he'd kind of solved you know that he'd come up with a theory of everything that made him the cleverest person in the world but that he was one of many people who'd realized that the mumbo jumbo about philosophy having the solutions to everything was itself uh, mumbo jumbo. Yeah. Okay. And and this brings us uh, to the final question, or better, the final sentence. And and I'm just going to quote his uh, the, the last sentence of the tractatus, and then we'll see if 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 you have something else to say about that, because you already mentioned a couple of things. So, what is there left to say about what we cannot speak about? You must pass over in silence. Yes, I'm glad. I'm glad you asked me that because one, one thing I've, I think people tend to underestimate is the ex is the presence of Søren Kierkegaard in mm. this book. In the, Wittgenstein started reading Kierkegaard, I think during the war in 1914, and um, translations from Danish into German started to appear in this avant-garde journal, the Innsbruck journal called Der Brenner. 
Mm -hmm. um, and Wittgenstein read it with great interest. And it was one of the articles that, um, one of the essays of uh, Kierkegaard that was published in the Brenner was um, about silence. And here's a, a, a little bit from it. Kierkegaard says, what is empty chatter? It's the result of doing away with the distinction between speaking and keeping silent. Only someone who knows how to remain essentially silent can speak essentially. Those who know how to keep silent will know the time to speak and the time to keep silent. Now, I mentioned that Wittgenstein uh, tried various literary publishers to um, to publish his his little essay, and mm. one of them was um, was was the, the publishing house associated with De Brenner, uh, okay. and so that he and he wanted it to be published as a pamphlet alongside their Kierkegaard pamphlets. Mm. And it seems to me it would be, would have been a little a slim little sort of rather poetic looking uh, pamphlet, not at all looking like a textbook. So I think it would have been much clearer if it had been published in 1918, 1919 by De Brenner as a little poetic pamphlet, people would have understood more what, what mm -hmm. kind of a book it is and that it's really an invitation to us to um, uh, to abandon our intellectual anxieties rather than some uh, intimidating book of um, some intimidating philosophical text that is made, made to people this which is designed to make us feel um uh, designed to humble us and make us feel how stupid we are because Wittgenstein's so clever I think mm. we would have understood that it's actually exactly the opposite of that which is the main message of this wonderful book okay thank you so much for this Jonathan as always it's a true pleasure talking with you and listening to you especially when you talk about Wittgenstein thank you thank so much Christoph Thanks also to our listeners for having joined us once again for this episode of Bookaholics. And you, dear listeners, if you like our volunteer work here at PICT, you can now also consider supporting us by becoming an active member of our institution. For more information about how to join PICT, please visit our website. My name is Christoph van Houten. Thank you and goodbye. <laughs>